All right. It's a pleasure to introduce and welcome Behçet Açıkmeşe. I'm one of the very few people who can pronounce his name correctly. <laughs> so um, Behçet received his PhD at Purdue University in Aerospace, I believe, is that right? Um, and then uh, worked at JPL for some years and that's when I got to meet him. Um, so at Purdue, he worked with Martin Corliss. I think Martin was a PhD student of George Lightman way, way back here at Berkeley. So that makes Pechet a academic grandson of George Lightman. So, um, so I met him when he was at JPL and he did, he did some very interesting work. While there, he worked on the so-called soft landing problem of NASA uh, in a fuel optimal fashion. And he worked on convexifying everything he could find while he was at JB JPL. So this soft landing problem had non-convex actuated constraint constraints, and he was able to formulate a reformulation, a relaxation that made it convex. And he went further and showed that there's no loss. It's a lossless convexification. So he was able to solve the problem as a convex problem then. He also went further and developed methods for uh, developing customized code so that these problems can be solved in real time on board the lander. So those results made him famous and he got lots of job offers. So he was at University of Texas first in Austin and then it was too hot there. So he moved to University of Washington. Now he's feeling too cold. So <laughs> we'll see what happens next. So. His most recent line of work has to do with uh, sequential convex programming. And in my group, we've used this. This is a direct optimal control solution method, numerical. And we've been using that with great success and it solved big problems for us. So uh, Behjet received many awards, uh, including most recently the IEEE Control System Society Award for Technical Excellence in Aerospace control. And I'll read the citation. It says, for outstanding contributions to convex optimization-based control and its transitions and applications to airspace applications. So we were supposed to have Behjet here in person in March, but then the virus came and the campus closed. So we had to postpone. And I'm hoping that sometime in the near future, we'll get him in person again, whether to give a talk or not, but you wanted to, to come and see us in person. Um, with that, I'll leave the floor to Beche. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Murat, for your kind introduction and for uh, inviting me to give this seminar. Uh, uh, Murat summarized uh, most of the actually subjects I'll uh, cover today. Uh, it's on optimization-based control for agile autonomous systems, I guess. Uh, and I'll start with basically the talk will be a mix of applications and some sort of, you know, supporting theory and computation, let's say. And if you have questions, you can stop me. I think one advantage of being online is uh, I'm a bit more flexible. Uh, I'm in my basement, very relaxed. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the story started, as Murat mentioned, uh, I was uh, at JPL, NASA Jet Propulsion Labs, uh, where I was hired to, to the controls group, which developed, uh, still develops uh, control algorithms to control spacecraft, uh, onboard control algorithms uh, to control spacecraft. Uh, I was a key member of Mars Science Lab uh, landing team. Uh, this was a challenging project where, you know, this was the first time so much autonomous control was exercised for landing a vehicle on Mars. Actually, it was acknowledged to be the key technology for the success of the mission. So uh, I was, I designed one of the controllers that was used during the landing and it had, uh, you know, not the most, uh, the, the fanciest uh, optimization, but it had some optimization and it was key uh, to the success of the phase where, for which I designed the controller. Uh, let's see. And then uh, came, uh, you know, in 2013, maybe one of the first demonstration of optimization-based control, what it can do. Uh, it's G-fault testing. G-fault stands for Guidance for Fuel Optimal Large Diverse. I'll talk about this in detail. So uh, this was a 
test demonstration, but uh, this was uh, closely watched by some interested parties. And also I, I must say, I worked with uh, a lot of these people who made the SpaceX landings possible. Uh, I, I had a relatively minor uh, direct impact on that, but uh, I had a, uh, quite a bit of impact in terms of how they looked at these problems uh, and the fact that uh, most of the key people who worked on this worked with me before going to SpaceX, I guess. Uh, and then I also applied these ideas while at JPL to different missions, uh, from formation flying to mission concepts to comets, asteroids, uh, different applications. Uh, none of them I was able to get involved to the completion of the mission or, or some test demonstration, but we at least exercised them on high fidelity simulations, let's say. Uh, and then I came to academia. Uh, in academia, I, have, I don't have spacecraft to launch. I don't have as much funding. So what I do is I, they, give, they were kind enough to give me a lab, some startup. So the student you see on screen right now built my lab. His name is Michael Sumuk. Uh, he is now with Amazon Prime Air. Thanks to him, he built the lab, every, pretty much everything. I just I hustle people for money. And uh, then, uh, uh, he developed this quadro result, describe a little bit, and then show some movies on which we exercise these algorithms uh, and new algorithms that we develop uh, quite a bit. And again, I'll talk about those things more in detail. Then we took these algorithms outside. We start using, instead of a motion capture indoors, start using GPS. We even built an interface uh, to, to specify problems in a more humanly possible way, rather than with math, uh, this interface converts what you specify into maths and then fly algorithms on board vehicles. And we also developed uh, different, like we have a quad order swarm, not swarm, but 10 of them, but it will be 20. Now we also have a 30 rover swarm. Uh, they have different dynamics. You can't crash them. You can operate them for a long time. That's the advantage, but they are not as agile, uh, of course. Uh, so the lab is more capable, but they, the commonality they share is they share the same autopilot uh, set of algorithms. Now I'll first give an outline of what the autonomous control system look like. Again, this is maybe my taste, uh, my take on it, and it's a kind of caricaturization a little bit, but it gives uh, key components. At the top, there is a mission planner, uh, followed by typically a tactical planner, and then trajectory planner, and the feedback controller. Again. They, these things materialize in different ways, okay? Uh, but you can think uh, mission and tactical planning as uh, high level commands to an autonomous system. It can be like mission planning, maybe, oh, I will do a mission to you know, some planet. I'll uh, you know, leave Earth at some point, reach somewhere at some other point. You define outline of the mission. And then uh, you, you have to execute the mission. For that, you, have a, you need a tactical plan, or maybe some things you planned for didn't go well. Maybe a sensor died all along the way. Maybe an actuator got stuck. Things can go wrong. Or maybe some other thing happened. So you have to have a way to adjust your mission plan. Then, uh, you know, these are at a higher level. Then it has to go down, and there is a trajectory planner, which generates what we call dynamically feasible trajectories, uh, with whatever we know about the dynamics of the system. Uh, of course, you can still execute these things because you know things can at a higher frequency things can go wrong. For that, we typically have feedback controls, right? and you know depending on how autonomous you are, you do some of these things uh, on board uh, with algorithms without humans getting involved. And other parts, you don't uh, you you don't leave too much to the algorithms, and uh, engineers are involved in decision making. In some cases, this is not possible, of course, and I'll talk about those in this. Now, uh, I like to make this a bit clear. I'll focus on, if we go back, trajectory planning and feed mostly in this talk, but I'll talk about feedback control too. I'm not gonna talk as much about tactical planning and mission planning, though I have some work on tactical planning. Of course, when you work with optimization, you also work with mission planning to some extent, but I'll focus on trajectory planning and feedback control. And I want to make it a bit clear at the beginning what I mean by that. Basically, you can think of trajectory planning to go from a state to another state, to go from point A to B, like, you know, if you think of a vehicle. Uh, what you do is, depending on the vehicle, your actuators, uh, you say that, okay, you use your dynamic model, typically it comes from Newton's law or some other law, 
uh, and you generate a trajectory, meaning that if everything you knew were uh, correct, you could have closed your eyes and execute the controls you compute, and it would have done this red line, if you like, within the specifications of the mission, which is caricaturized by the green area, the area enclosed by the green <clears throat> boundary. Uh, but oh, oh, you, life, you can never do that. Even if you close your eyes, you want to step, uh, you know, the standard example of feedback control. If I close my eyes and try to walk across my room, I'll probably run into trouble. If I want to do it faster, I will run into bigger problems. So uh, for that, you need feedback control, uh, which provides you, you know, with constant feedback from sensors. I didn't draw every component in this, in this block diagram, but what uh, feedback control does is it estimates your current state and then applies some corrective action, uh, which is provided by feedback control. So you can think of trajectory planning as generating explicit actions that if you had taken and if it would have taken you to the right place, if everything you thought you was correct was, was real, was actually reality. And feedback control is the policy that deals with, uh, uh, with, with deviations in the environment and it allows you to handle that. So in reality, what happens is not the red line, what happens is the black line. And with the way that you uh, model the uncertainty in the environment uh, and the way that you design your feedback controllers, you try to ensure that the black line, the actual trajectory, stays within a region around the red line. Again, this is a simplification, but this is not far off the reality. And how well you do those things uh, makes you, you know, it, it prepares you for a mission and it executes the mission robustly, you know. Now, in typical trajectory planning problem, uh, uh, your input to the system is uh, your nominal system dynamics, your knowledge of the dynamics and the trajectory specifications and goals. Uh, you know, this is my F equals to MA for a vehicle, for example. And then uh, specifications can be, uh, these are my actuators, they have certain saturation limits. Don't fly too fast, don't do this, don't do that. Those are your specifications. And your goals is maybe you want to minimize fuel or you want to maximize some other thing that depends on the mission. Uh, uh, what you do for trajectory planning, again, at the high level is you set up, that's what I do at least, as an optimal control problem. Uh, you, you then uh, convert it into what we call a finite uh, dimensional optimization problem. Typically, uh, an optimal control problem is infinite dimensional. It's over functional spaces. Uh, but then to make it uh, tractable, you turn it into a finite dimensional one on finite dimensional vector spaces. Then you use some numerical optimization technique to solve the problem. And the output is the nominal feasible control trajectory and nominal feasible state trajectory. Sometimes I won't make this distinction and I'll just say feasible trajectory. What I mean is the combination of both. And in feedback control, again, that is, is uh, at least what I do. I have a model of uncertainty. I have some robustness specifications. You know, if you took an undergrad controls, this can be gain phase margin. If you take more advanced courses, it can be other things. Uh, then I use robust nonlinear control theory. Uh, again, personally, I, try to, I like merging frequency domain and state space uh, control techniques. I use a lot of Nyquist theory. Then I try to use circle and Popov criteria. And I use both their frequency domain interpretations as well as uh, more modern control theoretic interpretations. Each one may be quite powerful in the way that you handle things. And uh, if you use, for example, modern control uh, theoretic techniques, then you end up with uh, sometimes uh, what they call linear matrix inequalities, LMIs, or sum of squares type of techniques, which are, you know, uh, anyways, I'll discuss a little bit of those. Then what you obtain is a feedback control policy. Uh, and uh, with the combination of the nominal control and the feedback control policy, you get the actual feasible trajectories, hopefully. That's, that's the idea. That's the high, at the high level, these are the pieces. And I, I like to put this because if you are taking courses, maybe you can map it to some courses you may wanna take or you took. So I like convex optimization. I'll make a jump because in, both, in these techniques, both techniques, I mentioned that uh, optimization, the word optimization quite a bit. Actually, what I do is I set these problems up uh, as optimization problems typically. 
And when I do that, uh, unfortunately, in many cases, these problems turn out to be complicated optimization problems, which we call non-convex optimization problems, which is a bit not uh, very descriptive. But in general, what happens is uh, there's the cost function you have to minimize uh, or maximize. And then you, uh, you do this minimization, let's say, over a set. In a non-convex optimization, the cost function may have strange shapes like uh, at the top, which may have multiple minima, for example, which is a problem. And uh, the set you are optimizing also may have this non-convexity, which uh, what it means is that if you, there are two points you can find and draw a line in between them, then the line goes out of the set. That means it's a non-convex set. It's not a good situation if you have a non-convex set. It makes things hard. The convexification step is a key step to deal with this problem. What it does is it converts these uh, problems into nice problems. Nice problems are convex problems, uh, which are problems where the function you are minimizing have this nice convex shape with uh, unique, or in general, it doesn't have to be unique, but let's say unique optima. And the sets you are optimizing are also nice sets. No matter which two points you take, you uh, connect with the line, the line entirely stays in the set. And if you, uh, I mean, it's not that obvious to see this uh, from pictures in reality because the problems are higher dimensional and such, but at the heart, this is, it's as simple as this. And basically the convexification is a way of converting the problem into a non-convex optimization problem into a convex one because for convex problems, the, uh, we have algorithms which ensures, uh, ensure nice properties. Uh, you be, we are guaranteed to solve the problem to some numerical accuracy. Convergence to that uh, solution is guaranteed again. And because the solvers are so efficient, you can actually potentially solve some problems in real time, uh, reliably, uh, which uh, some of these uh, guarantees don't exist uh, for non-convex optimization problems. You have to do a lot of other things uh, even to get, uh, even to solve them with you in the loop, if you like. Now, uh, I guess I'll talk more about now trajectory optimization. I'll come back to trajectory optimization. These are my transitional slides that I forgot that I have. <laughs> uh, so first the control problem. Again, as I said, you have uh, a model of the system uh, with dynamics, which are typically nonlinear dynamics. You can run into nonlinear dynamics very quickly, actually. Um, state and control constraints. They can define sets you know, they come from sets, they can be they can be non-convex sets. And then you have cost rewards, they can be non-convex. This doesn't happen that uh, often, actually. You can lump all the non-convexity into constraints in general. Uh, the convexification step, uh, as I mentioned, there are two things we were able to do till now. That, so I'll also, this outlines my uh, talk, actually. Also, Murat mentioned about this already a little bit. Uh, if we have non-convex control constraints, uh, quite a gener general class of them, we found techniques of lossless convexification, which means that I can equivalently formulate these non-convex problems as convex problems. In that case, I don't have any loss, and I can get global optimal solutions in a reliable, fast way. If I cannot do that, then we uh, developed this technique called successive convexification, which is can, which can be seen as a, you know, in the class of sequential uh, convex programming methods. Uh, in this case, uh, all we can ensure is some local minima optimality, but even that is not that obvious. Uh, so in some case, in general, you can't even ensure that, but I'll talk about those nuances soon. And I'll now go to the application that motivated that. Again, uh, I wanna mix up applications as much as I can, and I'll show you movies too. Uh, this application was the application that got me into uh, op using optimization for trajectory planning. Before I, in my PhD, I didn't know what even trajectory planning was really, uh, but I knew quite a bit of optimization. I took control uh, courses in convex optimization in optimal control from uh, Berkowitz, Leonard Berkowitz, who I thought was a great uh, you know, scientist, but also teacher. Uh, I recommend his book actually, even though it's written in the 70s, it's still a very, very good book. Uh, anyways, uh, this is the Mars uh, landing problem. Uh, Mars, when we land on Mars, uh, what we do is the main mission, part of the mission, which is maybe the riskiest part is entry, descent and landing. Entry means when you enter the atmosphere of Mars, 
uh, and then uh, what you do is you start slowing down because of the friction and you use uh, the orientation of the vehicle you adjust it so that you know uh, you uh, try to generate the drag and lift forces so that you get you kill your velocity as much as possible but martian atmosphere is slow uh, sorry thin so you can't slow the vehicle down enough so what you do is you open a what we call a supersonic parachute at very high speeds uh, and then uh, that's not enough either. And at some point you cut the shoot and you turn on your thrusters, which uh, slow you down effectively to zero velocity and you establish touch time. Up to now, including the last mission to Mars and the current mission to Mars, which is Mars 2020, all we guarantee is a 10 kilometer radius accuracy around the nominal landing point. Actually, the previous missions were even worse, like 30 kilometers, if I'm not misremembering. Uh, in the future, what we want to do is we want to get really close to a given target so that we can land in interesting science targets in a crater, for example. And we want to land within a kilometer, even within hundreds of meters. To accomplish that, you need two key te technologies. One is an onboard sensor, because we don't have a GPS on Mars, which detects your uh, relative position relative to the target. And the second is, given that knowledge of where you are, uh, an algorithm ge generates an optimal trajectory to the target, uh, which comes as close as possible to the target. I think I talked about these things already. Let me move on. Sorry, I'm, oh, I only spent actually 15 minutes. I didn't realize that, sorry. I thought I already spent 30 minutes. Uh, so I'll focus on the trajectory planning problem. Uh, in this problem, uh, you can think of it as a ball, uh, and with a thruster attached to the ball, uh, which is a simple model, but good enough uh, to capture many uh, real effects. Uh, what that uh, thrust vector does is it, you can turn the thrust vector, which is literally a vector. Uh, that way you can affect the motion of the ball, if you like. And the main source of non-convexity in this problem is this by constraint on the thrust vector. If you think of the thrust vector in 2D, of course, it's a 3D vector, but let's uh, to draw it in 2D. One is, uh, once you turn on your thrusters, when you, once you ignite the engines, uh, there is an upper bound to thrust bound that you can get magnitude that defines an outer boundary of a circle. Right? But also there is a lower bound on the uh, thrust magnitude. The reason is uh, you, these thrusters typically, don't, you don't want to bring the thrust level below a certain threshold, otherwise they may shut down uh, and they may never restart and your mission is over. So this is typically 10 to 20%, which is quite significant actually. Those are the two constraints which generate uh, the, any of this uh, annulus, if you like, circular annulus area, which is the gray area, which is already non-convex because you know I can to take two points and the points will go, you know, the line be in between them easily will go out of the domain. Furthermore, this thrust vector is because it's a ball and a thrust vector is a simplification. But if your thrust vector looks down, that means you turn the vehicle upside down. You don't, you don't want to do that because something may be looking down like a radar or a camera. So this thrust vector cannot be moved too much. Uh, you can move it quite a bit, but not all the way. And there is a pointing direction constraint, if you like. Uh, with all this, uh, the region of feasible uh, controls is this blue area, all right? And that's clearly a non-convex area. Uh, I think you can convince yourselves to, that it is. That's what I'm saying in words here. Uh, so uh, this was my constraint. Then we, uh, we apply a trick uh, of lifting the constraint. I will explain the trick in 2D, but it applies in higher dimensions. We introduce a slack variable, this, I think it's gamma. My Greek always is bad. Uh, so uh, you, what you do is you, it's like uh, we had two concentrated uh, circles. You pull the one, the bigger one uh, out, if you like. And then you cut, you generate a cone and you cut the cone with a plane. Uh, and you generate a convex volume. Uh, and what you can uh, show is that the initial constraints, which were non-convex on this thrust variable T, with this new lifted version, uh, becomes convex constraints. Uh, 
but uh, what I, by doing that, I actually introduce frivolous solutions to the problem because I'm lifting it up. At some point, I have to project it back. In the lift, if I take the projection of the lifted controls, the projection actually is a convex set and it's more than what I started with. So it's actually, I introduce illegal solutions, if you like. But uh, what I do is if I solve for the optimal solution of this new lifted problem, all the optimal solutions will stay legal for the lifted problem. So you solve, you have a problem on a small set, which is non convex, you make it bigger in a way, and you solve it in a bigger set, or, and you show that all the optimal solutions are still legal or feasible for the original problem. That means they have to be optimal. That's the idea behind it. You have to make some mathematical arguments, but that's at the heart of the idea. So if you look at it, I, if I take a slice in this cone, slice along the gamma axis, if you like, it looks like this. Uh, uh, it looks like this, uh, like kind of brownish area that I draw uh, here. The original non-convex constraints are this uh, greenish, light greenish area, and uh, my color sensitivity is bad, but it's, I think, dark uh, green or something. That's the new uh, controls. Uh, and it's obviously going uh, you know, beyond the feasible domain. But what you can assure is that all the optimal controls will be on the red uh, line. Okay? And this red line has a nice property. For this new set, they are the extremal points of the uh, set. And basically what I'm doing is I'm ensuring that all the extremal points of the new sets uh, are, all the optimal solutions of the new problem are, have, must be these extremal points and which are in the original set. Again, we have a lot of uh, papers uh, describing this, uh, what's happening here, uh, but that's what's happening. And basically all we are trying to do is uh, in the lifted problem, we are ensuring that the lifted problem is non-singular almost everywhere, uh, you know, in the lingo of optimal control. Uh, is it the only application? Maybe I got lucky, you know, that's the only application. There is no other application. But it turned out that the VI found some other applications. I'll show, uh, show some. One is this uh, control of a quad order. Uh, you know, people typically try to control these things in a sixth off manner. Uh, I'm not in, uh, I won't go there immediately. I will do other things before I do uh, both coupled orientation and translational control. And one way I do it is, uh, or my team does, of course, I don't do anything these days, but um, uh, what they do is they uh, model these things as, uh, you know, translational control problems first. And uh, the way that you in handle a way of interaction is by uh, ensuring that this pointing direction of the thrust vector that you generate with propellers in a quad order also satisfies similar constraints. You can't turn it around too much for a variety of reasons. And we put all kinds of constraints, but it turned out that uh, some propellers have similar constraint that you don't want to turn off these propellers because if you turn off these propellers, you lose all your orientation control ability because there is nothing that will generate torque and you get torque by differentially uh, rotation or differential thrust. And when you have everybody is at zero thrust, you know, you don't, you don't have anything, you know, control for orientation, which is called attitude also sometimes. Uh, so the, it turns out that the thrust vector lives in a similar uh, space, like the rocket problem. And we solve this uh, 3D of freedom uh, or translational motion planning problem. We design our feedback controllers. They generate thrust vector. This thrust vector goes to our orientation controllers, which work at a higher frequency, if you like. And then they generate the torques and so on. There is a hierarchy of things. I like hierarchies. You don't want to make too many hierarchical levels because then it becomes corrupt hierarchy. But a good level of hierarchy allows you to solve a problem very, very effectively and verifiably. And if something goes wrong, you know where things may, might have gone wrong. By having no hierarchy or over hierarchy, you hide problems. Uh, you know, uh, you can easily hide problems. But uh, when you, with the right hierarchy, I think you can easily debug problems and so on. It has a lot of advantages. So. Uh, uh, all I'm saying is the same thing, I guess, in this message. Uh, Non-convex thrust constraints, you can use the same trick and you, like in rocket landing, and you get uh, it convexified. And then uh, we came across other constraints. For example, let's say I have uh, a control constraint like the thrust constraint, but 
only this uh, purple and, uh, I guess it's purple and uh, red uh, area are feasible. This is even worse non-convexity. You have non-convex regions themselves and they are disjoint also on top of it. Uh, then a uh, student of mine recently worked on it. Uh, you can uh, relax this uh, or lift this as we did before, but it's still non-convex because of the disjointedness. Typically people use mixed integer programming techniques where they introduce binary variables when they see these constraints. And those binary variables capture them right, but uh, they make them really, really hard problems because as you add binary variables, you have to search a binary tree, it's painful. And as you add more, uh, then you are multiplying with two. If you have 10 the binary variables, it's two to the 10 uh, possibilities and so on. Uh, then there is another uh, constraint that basically we take these binary constraints and relax. Uh, and then you can, uh, then the math, maths get really complicated, but under some uh, quite general conditions that you can check in advance, uh, that takes a bit of time. You can ensure that with these relaxations or lifting plus relaxations, you can generate optimal control problems which are convex and their optimal solutions are still feasible for the original problem. But you do a lot of math and checking uh, of the assumptions in advance, all right? And some of these assumptions, you have to write code to check them. But once you check them, then you can uh, solve these optimization problems very, very effectively with the peace of mind that you will get optimal solutions and you can uh, solve them in real time and so on. An example to that, there is a nice movie my student made. If you are interested, I'll send these slides. You can check those movie, that movie. If I have time, I'll show it. Um, it's not a real thing, but it's a realistic uh, it's a video. Uh, here you have two spacecraft in space. Uh, one is the Apollo command module. The other is some other module. One module is rotating with this constant speed. Uh, you know, the other guy is trying to duck with that. So, uh, you know, you are, something is rotating in space and you are trying to duck with it. And the relative dynamics of these systems can get really tricky at times, even the linearized versions. And there are interesting things. You have a bunch of thrusters on this uh, docking uh, spacecraft, 12, 16, and they are on-off thrusters with the uh, upper bound in thrust that they can give a lower bound and they can be off too. So there is another binary decision there. Should I turn it on or off? And if I turn it off, uh, what's the right thrust and so on. We use these uh, techniques together with some other stuff. I'm throwing a lot of things under the rock here. There's a paper. Um, then you can uh, uh, successfully convectify these problems and solve them in a very, very reasonable time. If you throw these problems into mixed integer uh, solvers, uh, numerical optimizers, they take forever. If you, you know, if you have 16 thrusters, you will wait for a solution forever. But if you convexify them and solve them properly, you will get the answers very, very quickly in a matter of seconds or sub-seconds in this case, actually. Much much faster. And these are really legitimately large problems in terms of decision, size of decision, decision variables. Uh, and uh, we checked, uh, is optimization any useful? Actually, that's another question you will hear a lot. You are doing all these things, you are optimizing this and that, is it any good? I mean, what if I do something heuristic, would I beat it? Uh, in the Mars pinpoint landing problem that I showed, uh, believe me, no, 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 JPL is full of very smart engineers. If they didn't need it, uh, they wouldn't have used it. They have been using it uh, for the last 15 years. I developed it a long time ago. Even after I left, they have been using it. So it's not that I have to be there either. So that shows that they are autonomous. Uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, for example, in this example, uh, it saved almost 80% of the fuel use. When you are not careful, you can use, uh, when you use, but seems like reasonable heuristic. Without knowing, you may be using a lot of resources and fuel is very important for space application. And in the Mars landing problem, without optimal trajectories, you can't even find feasible trajectories that are aggressive enough to take you to the target. It's not optimality in many cases that you care. It's the finding something feasible. And uh, if you are in a tight situation, if you are in a corner case, if you don't have ability to find the optimal, you will have no ability to find the feasible because maybe the only choice, there is only one or two choices and you have to find one. I'm just simplifying, but that's why 
though up to optimality may look like something nice to have, it's sometimes essential to have because it means that you can find feasible solutions, just solutions that are possible, you know. Another problem, again, with the major non-convexity, again, another landing problem. I like spacecraft examples. Control has a lot of good applications in aerospace. Um, in this, again, a landing rocket, but in this case, uh, you have an engine, a rocket engine, that can be gimbaled or rotated relative to the rocket itself. You, know, you can rotate six, seven degrees in two axes, if you like. And this, uh, the, the thing is that if you are at a low thrust, you can gimbal more. If you are at a high thrust, you don't want to gimbal a lot. So the region is this uh, union of this blue and red area. Again, highly non-convex. Again, with the tricks that we have been using, you can convexify these things. I'm just giving you examples now, uh, rather than I'll, uh, giving solutions, but giving examples to this te technique. Now, as, uh, uh, these are some aerospace examples, but quadrotor example, I would say, it will be very useful these days because you know everybody has some sort of drone flying around, and it doesn't have to be a quadrotor; it can be a XR order, whatever. Uh, they have different constraints. Uh, I have worked on different types of these vehicles, and uh, in each one, we were able to use these uh, techniques. Now, the next question is: Okay, you somehow managed to do this, but uh, theoretically, and you show its use, can you solve these things in real time? Uh, for, for that, uh, uh, we adopted a take, you know, uh, an approach which was, I think, first uh, impro introduced with, uh, by Stephen Boyd. Actually, I worked with him briefly while well, I was at JPL, so I have to give him credit. He said, why don't you customize uh, your solvers for the problem? Uh, his student, uh, Jacob Mattingly, I think, is now in a private industry. He developed this uh, CVX Gen software. Maybe you are aware of it if you ever did work on convex optimization. What it does is instead of generating a solver which solves a class of convex optimization problems, he, he took this solver that solves a class, he specialized it to his problem. And there are many tricks to do this. Uh, they are all well documented in uh, papers. And what uh, you actually accomplish by doing that is you you make your computations more effective, more efficient. You use a lot of tricks to make them faster. And uh, you know the observation is that you can make them several orders of magnitude faster in many problems. Uh, I wouldn't say that you can do this type of stuff with large size problems. But if the problems are uh, small size or to mid size, maybe you will be able to do that. So it's not like a cure for every type of problem. but. For Mars landing problem, it was appropriate to use them. And we developed our own uh, customizers. One problem was they had the customizers for linear and quadratic programming problems, which is a subclass of complex optimization. Our problem was a second order comprogramming problem. Uh, if our customizer didn't work, I would have gone back uh, crying and then uh, tried to formulate the problem as a QP somehow with some approximations so I could use their solvers. But fortunately, we were able to generate our own solver and uh, use this custom solver, uh, the custom solver that we generated. Just to give you a sense, again, these numbers are a bit outdated because you know it's, uh, these things are getting faster and faster. But at the time when I started working on this problem in uh, early 2004, uh, there was a solver to solve this uh, landing problem. It took uh, this solver 50 to 60 seconds to generate one trajectory because it was using a nonlinear programming technique. And uh, even in cases where I mean, this, there is a solution, sometimes it didn't find the solution. You had to do a lot of tweaking. So uh, that didn't work well. After we introduced this convex optimization based approach, uh, uh, we could solve this problem uh, within a couple of seconds, two, three seconds in MATLAB. Uh, with the custom solver, we could solve it under five milliseconds. So it could be done in real time, and with all, you know, with theoretically with guarantees, you know, it will never fail within some threshold. Uh, it will not fail. Uh, just as another example, this trust gam gimbaling problem. If you introduce uh, the last one I showed uh, with binary variables, 
with non-convex solvers, with mixed integer solvers, it can take up to 200 to 600 seconds. Uh, again, uh, with convex solvers, you can get it down to two, three seconds. Huge difference, even recently. This is a recent uh, comparison. But the problem was, uh, I don't think we tried the custom solver on this one. I'll show you now some, actually maybe one movie, but uh, I'll show a movie of this algorithm in, in doing something real, okay? We did uh, with JPL3 and Maston Aerospace, which is a small uh, company which built the rocket. We did three, uh, in three consecutive years, we did te uh, three test campaigns. In the second year, we uh, flew the onboard solver autonomously, completely autonomous. And I'll show you the movie for that one. Hopefully it will work fine. And all these movies are, uh, and or the links to these movies are on my website and our uh, YouTube channel. Please sign up to our YouTube channel. We are very poor in terms of our uh, uh, subscribers, <laughs> not even close to any popular site. All right, let's see. As the mass and engineering team performs the final system checks on zombie, JPL's new fuel optimal large divert guidance algorithm known as G-Fold is about to get its largest demonstration to date. With support from NASA's Flight Opportunities Program, this groundbreaking project enables JPL to validate robust landing technology. This Google Earth visualization is created from the actual trajectory data recorded by zombie in flight. The trajectory may look simple, but this flight represented an unprecedented achievement in autonomous rocket technology. The half mile translation across the desert was in fact a spontaneous landing diversion in which the rocket was commanded to abort its initial nearby landing spot during final approach, aggressively change direction, and begin following a new trajectory that was first calculated only one second earlier. The G-Fold computer calculated this new trajectory mid-air in real time choosing a new landing site in the distance and optimizing the path through the sky to burn the least amount of fuel possible. Although the engineering teams knew the intended landing diversion before launch, the vehicle systems received the updated instructions mid-flight with no advance warning. Once commanded to change direction, the system instantly throttled up the engine and aimed the vehicle hard over to meet the new objective. This flight was yet another expansion of Zombie's vehicle flight dynamics reaching a maximum altitude of 1,200 feet while flying out of plane with the landing pads, then traversing downrange nearly a half mile over the desert floor at more than 50 miles an hour before gently touching down within nine inches of its target. Just to give you an idea, this is a single plastic. It's literally the analogy used in the industry is broom stick on your finger. Uh, and there's a onboard camera, not the greatest movie, uh, but uh, it shows you this is the Mojave Desert where this experiments are done, a bunch of old airplanes. Um, basically, uh, you are, it's keep on moving quickly. This is because of the feedback. There's also feedback controllers running to keep the trajectory uh, you know, under the uncertainties, if you like. Uh, it's a difficult control problem. Uh, and these rockets are not designed to go sideways. They are designed to go you know, straight. So uh, that was a useful uh, thing to do for Mars and but it pr proved to be useful for Earth landings as demonstrated by SpaceX missions. They also used, maybe uh, the first time a company used it on a, such a big scale, uh, like convex optimization. I'll, I'll quote that to them, uh, in my slides, I believe. But this happened, uh, I think, three years before they did anything. Well, of course, with a much smaller rocket. Again, as I said, uh, SpaceX did uh, use convex optimization in their landing, and it was a critical piece. They didn't do it for fun or because they had uh, some research project. Uh, you know, they needed something like this, and uh, it became an enabling technology for them. And there is a quotation by Lars Blackmore, who was my close collaborator and the lead engineer, uh, the chief engineer for their controls group, which developed all these algorithms. I'll send my slides after the presentation so you can have it. Now, not every problem is convex. So what do you do? We have a technique called successive convexification. Uh, the idea in successive convexification is similar to maybe other nonlinear te optimization techniques, but a bit geared towards trajectory optimization. 
Uh, you started the initial trajectory guess, which can be a really bad guess, by the way. Uh, and then uh, you start iterating on it. You linearize your dynamics around this uh, and convexify all your constraints around this nominal trajectory that you assume. And then you generate another one and you use that one to do the same things and you iterate. Uh, very intuitive, uh, very simplistic at the high level, uh, but it's, it turns out to be very powerful. The idea is that though different than other methods, maybe, at every iteration, you solve the sub-problem that you generated to, fully, it's to, full, it's, to its full optimal. That's the idea. Uh, I, I don't know how much time I have, but uh, under some uh, assumptions, which are kind of generic, you can prove that this technique is convergent uh, mathematically. Uh, but there are some bad news, I must say. Uh, you can prove that it's convergent, and our experience is it's really, really convergent. In this example of landing with a bunch of aerodynamic forces and such, we show that you know after seven, eight iterations, typically these things converge very, very fast. Uh, computational load for each computation is also manageable thanks to convex optimization. So these things can be implemented on board. We have been flying these things on our quad rotors. I'll show you. Uh, and you know when you compare with existing uh, methods, like if you use, for example, F min cone of MATLAB, that it's like the silly test almost. Like I would never recommend using it for anything serious. Um, but you know it's it, it's converges, but it does a poor job. Then we use uh, SNOP, which is a great solver uh, as a generic uh, solver. It does uh, the red one. Uh, our method seems to uh, once it stop, starts picking up speed, it seems to converge very, very fast relative to that. That's that has been our experience. And per iteration, it's really uh, cheap. Uh, but the catch is that the converged solution doesn't have to be feasible, even if uh, the original problem is a feasible solution. I cannot guarantee in advance that I'll find that feasible solution. All I can guarantee is that. The, this uh, method will converge to something which has some nice mathematical properties, but unfortunately not the one that you want. Uh, that's, I guess, uh, uh, but again, that's why you have to practice this method, but I, we have a remedy for that too. I'll discuss a little bit after a while, but that's all we could prove uh, theoretically. Now, uh, I wanna go to some, uh, you know, I alluded to numerical technique now in each, whether it's fully lossless convexified problem or successive convexification where I'm solving a bunch of convex problems in a sequence, I have to solve these convex optimization problems. More clearly, I have to solve second order comprogramming problems. These are the most general class of problems we solve. And uh, you, know, you can write these problems that we are solving in this generic form. Uh, a quadratic cost, minimize a quadratic cost, uh, where you have some equality constraints which are linear. All convex optimization problems have, have to have linear equality constraints. If they are non-linear, the problem becomes non-convex. So it's not a simplification. And X is also in a convex set, another convex set, which is defined by a bunch of inequality constraints. So I'm hiding all these things under the rack of script C here. X is my solution variable. P doesn't have to be actually positive definite, but here I said positive definite. It can be positive semi-definite. C is closed and convex set. It has to be closed. It has to have all its limit points. It can be unbounded, actually. Typically, it's not unbounded, but it can be. Now, I'll propose an algorithm, uh, which uh, is a new algorithm that we are working on. It's inspired by existing algorithms, clearly. Uh, and it's also inspired by a lot of things people do these days. If you are in robust control in Berkeley, there is a group of people who work on this and elsewhere, I must say, uh, where people start seeing connections between optimization and robust control, and they try to interpret optimization algorithms with a robust control point of view, which is great, actually. I like that line of research. Uh, uh, and this is one of the, I see this also within this uh, class of techniques. In this uh, method, it's a very simple method to explain. Uh, you have to know what projection operator is to convex sets. It's basically an operator that finds the closest point to a given point in the set, okay? It's literally what you know as the projection operator on a subspace, for example, but it's pro properly defined. So uh, this is an algorithm we recently submitted, which is a variation of an existing algorithm with a better complexity analysis that we obtained. It basically has two terms in it. Uh, 
uh, or three things it does. To up, given an initial starting point X, if you like, your current iterate of the algorithm, it has this red thing, which is the standard gradient, negative of the gradient of the cost. You have uh, what we call an integrator term in, uh, in, in, in a brown color uh, that you feed back. Uh, so this looks like actually, and then you do the projection over on the iterate uh, to the set of feasible solutions. The assumption is that you can do that projection fast, reliably. That becomes an interesting issue, actually, but I'll talk about it later. Um, and then uh, you update you what we call your integrator state V. This looks like, awfully looks like a PI controller, actually, in control systems. And I'll actually, I will draw the control system. Of course, this is an integrator, uh, this is in discrete time. Uh, I'll uh, draw an equivalent, uh, equivalent uh, continuous time version of it. Here is your plant in green box. It's a dynamical system. It's a single integrator. It's your plant. There is the projection operator in the feedback loop. It's like your nonlinearity, if you like. And then you have a PI controller, uh, you know, which, which has a proportion. Whenever I have triangles, that means it's a static operator. Uh, and uh, in boxes, you have a dynamic operator. And it's an integrator. It's a bit more fancy integrator because you pre and post multiply with G and G transpose. But this is literally what it is. I actually actually have a simulink diagram with this uh, form, and I do optimization with continuous uh, dynamics. You know, it's fun to do if you are interested. Uh, and also, I like this method. The reason is before I was using interior point method algorithms. I still use them because we have a lot of software implemented in C and whatnot. But I like this because I can explain this algorithm to any controller engineer and he will buy that this algorithm will work. The other algorithm, my interior point method algorithm, I forget how it works after a point. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, this algorithm is developed in the uh, optimization domain. I understood them, but I'm not in that domain. I learned them, you know, I may have some minor tweaks here and there, but uh, you know, they have this whole literature devoted to that. To explain that to a controls engineer is not a very practical thing to do. And understanding your algorithm is an important part of your verification process. If you ask somebody to fly something they didn't understand, it's very hard. I convinced them, but you know, it took me a long time. Uh, but this is much easier to explain. Hopefully they will work. The only, uh, there are some open questions, but hopefully they will do a equally good job. That's an open question. And uh, you, with these algorithms, you can take advantage of the problem structure. If you look at uh, uh, the problems we are solving, they are typically, they have typically this form, like where the cost constraints are temporally decoupled. The thing couple, that couples them is the dynamics, which is typically linearized or linear. You can take advantage of this uh, temporal decoupled nature of it. It's not that we did it first. There were other people who recognized that. And if you can project this, uh, uh, the projection is now on smaller part of the solution variable, which is temporally decoupled, which you can do very, very effectively, actually. Uh, actually, analytically, you don't have to do this projection numerically. Typically, if the set is a complex convex set, you cannot do it analytically. You have to do it numerically. It's, it's another problem. Like, you, to solve your problem, you have to solve your problem. It's like a bit strange, uh, but in this case, you have a uh, you have a uh, you have a analytical base for many many sets, uh, you know. And this can be applied to successive convexification because in successive convexification we have ultimately sub problems of this kind. Okay? And this is the algorithm. If you modify the algorithm for this uh, optimal uh, you know, trajectory optimization problems, you have a bit more complicated version of it. I'm not going to dwell on it. But these are some typical sets for which you can do the projections very quickly, half spaces, uh, boxes, uh, uh, circles, or balls, and second order cones. You can do these projections very, very fast. And the two sets on the top are actually unbounded, but close, convex sets, just for reference. And uh, we have some complexity analysis uh, and interpretation of them are really painful. But all I can say is that all they say is it works very, very fast. And per iteration count, uh, complexity is very, uh, very low. That's what it says. I'll give you an example. 
in comparison to existing methods like ADMM is uh, matrix splitting and other methods, dual fast gradient and so on. Our method is the one we read and I'm sort of showing an example where it worked really well. Uh, all the example we, uh, we tried, it worked well. Maybe we'll see some examples that uh, the others will add to us, but uh, they, our method is an improvement on them. So I suspect it will do well. Hopefully it will do in, well in general. Now, I, let me check how much time. Do you mind if I take another five, six minutes uh, or should I stop soon? What do you think? Uh, I think because you have open office hours from five to six, you're welcome to take more time. I think it'll just help us have more discussion. Okay. I'll try to wrap it up in the next 10 minutes. How about Sounds that? Good. Yeah. And I'll show you some movies afterwards and we can start questioning them. Uh, uh, now we did all these things, uh, but uh, now uh, how do we ensure uh, feasibility for successive convexification? It's still a problem, all right? For that, uh, I used uh, some ideas from robust control. I will use what some people call invariant tubes, in more, uh, for example, in robust model predictive control. Now they rebranded these things as invariant funnels. They are the same thing, uh, just the methods are different for different people. Uh, so the idea is this, uh, you, all, you generate a bunch of uh, trajectories offline, all right? Uh, and they uh, and denote these trajectories, uh, both state and control as X bar and U bar. X is state, U bar is control. And uh, you know, they are uh, feasible uh, trajectories you generate. Then uh, what you do is uh, an F of T script F represent the feasible domain if you like. By the way, there is a small error in the first bullet. I shouldn't have had this script either, but anyways. Uh, maybe I should have. No, no, I should have. Uh, then uh, you design also offline feedback policies. There's no uncertainty in this. Everything is known. I'm doing trajectory generation. But the uncertainty is in the initial state, if you like. What will happen is if I generate a lot of trajectories offline for given initial different initial states, if I had a machine to generate for all initial states, which is impossible of course, but then I could have just tabulated them and whenever my initial state changes, I could have picked them up from that initial, you know, from that table and I could have used them. I can't do that because you know, you can't have infinite size table, uncountable actually, not infinite, but uncountable. So, um, so what you do is, uh, one thing you can do is, uh, you generate a policy together with a trajectory. What that policy does is, if you start a bit off from the initial trajectory, it keeps you close enough to the trajectory that you optimize. And if you, uh, intuition is that if you keep it close enough, then uh, it will be feasible. It won't go beyond, uh, uh, you know, beyond the feasible domain. That's the idea. That way, if I encode the trajectories with associated feedback loops, I'm actually encoding a set of trajectories. Uh, I'm encoding it with a finite uh, parameterization, if you like, all right? That's the idea. And I'm using feedback control ideas for that. Actually, linear matrix inequalities, all this stuff. Uh, and this is the picture. What I do is I generate the red trajectory. Uh, then uh, I generate the feedback law which ensures that if I start uh, on the left in this green area, any initial condition in green area with the feedback law plus the nominal trajectory will stay in, stay in this green area, the area you know, bounded by these green lines. And it will take me to the smaller green ellipse at the end. And it will be, they will be all be feasible. And I call this uh, region I because I'm using the concepts of controlled invariance basically to ensure this, okay? That way, all I'm doing is to the right, if, uh, if you project uh, this space to uh, space of initial states, I'm generating a bunch of ellipses in this case for simplicity, uh, where the red dots uh, denote the initial uh, optimized trajectory, green area denote all the initial conditions that I can handle with the feedback policy. And all I'm trying to do is uh, cover this set of feasible, all feasible initial conditions with this uh, ellips ellipses, if you like. If I cover them well, what happens is, of course, this is another problem. Uh, uh, what happens is I, if you give me an initial state for which I, like I'm flying, let's say I'm doing something, 
I can take that state that I have to compute my trajectory at this moment. I can look at my table and then I can see, oh, here it falls into this ellipse, ellipse number uh, five. I know the feedback policy and the nominal trajectory there, and I can generate a feasible trajectory, not optimal, but a feasible trajectory. Sometimes people call these things near optimal or something like that. Uh, but anyways, you get a feasible trajectory which uh, satisfies all the constraints. There are difficulties, of course. How will you cover an unconvex space? It's a hard problem. You know, not that we will claim that we cover it properly. Uh, but this is something you can do. Also, in, you have to generate tables that you can inquire from fast. That's also another algorithmic problem. Actually, we worked on this type of problems for mixed integer convex programs, which are non-convex problems. And we developed some techniques. It's documented in a recent paper uh, uh, with theoretical guarantees, but it's, it's not easy. Uh, but it's uh, at least an approach to ensuring uh, feasibility. And uh, to do that, I'm going into the guts of what, what's happening. Basically, you write the dynamics relative to your trajectory, nominal trajectory. Again, nothing big deal here. Then you generate a uh, uh, linear time varying system with constraints. Uh, and this fits well with successive convexification too, because you know this uh, literally that's what we do there too. And uh, this is the part I like the most here uh, to capture all the deviations in the dynamics with the, this p term that shows up. We use what we call incremental quadratic inequalities. If you took any control course in robust control, you might have seen the sector bounded nonlinearities and all this stuff. They play, in my opinion, a very crucial role in understanding control theory and nonlinear control, robust control. And you, it's a tool that you can use both in both nonlinear control and robust control. Actually, even things you learned like gain phase margins, things of that nature, frequency domain specifications, there are ways to specify them via in state space via this, uh, this, this uh, sector bounded uh, things. Okay. I think they are at the core of combining a lot of techniques in frequency domain and uh, state space. And they are also, they turn out to be very useful in this uh, uh, analysis, which looks kind of de detached from those discussions, you know? Uh, and I think you have the right person that Murat, uh, who knows all these things very well. Uh, so, and then what you ensure is that as long as your nonlinearity is in this yellow region, which I bounded uh, with cons, you can use Lyapunov theory and you can construct Lyapunov functions. In this case, I'm constructing a time varying uh, quadratic Lyapunov function. It's a linear piece, but time variation is piecewise linear. And I'm ensuring a form of exponential stability, which also ensures some form of, you know, uh, funnels that are uh, generated, uh, defined by ellipsoids, which are changing shape, size, and whatnot. And there are a bunch of papers uh, we and other people wrote, and there are also further generalizations because ellipsoids come from quadratic Lyapunov functions. If you want to go to even higher order uh, Lyapunov functions, you can use, for example, some of squares techniques and uh, other things. Again, I'm not going to go into details, uh, but I like this area and I. I have some ongoing work, hopefully it will come up soon, also on design of these things. Now I'll show you some movies. And it, during the movies, uh, uh, you can ask me questions uh, as well. As I said, we have our own lab. All the quadrotors in our lab are in-house designed. All the circuitry are designed by Michael Zumuk, Miki Zumuk. Uh, the, you know, our autopilot is auto design, our design, you know, our codes, every line of code is designed in-house which has a lot of advantages. The disadvantage is uh, that uh, it's not uh, based on RAS or something like that, that people use. But uh, the advantage is that I can squeeze a lot of control authority out of the system because I know what it's doing. Uh, now I'll show you some movies. First, an example of successive convexification on a quad rotor, uh, you know, uh, tra traversing 10 obstacles. And two things I want to you to pay attention. One is the number of obstacles. The second is the computations are done on board on our, uh, you know, by uh, you know by using our solvers, uh, interior point method algorithms to solve via successive convexification. Uh, the other thing is the control authority. Again, I didn't talk much about the feedback control, but one of the things I really take a lot of, uh, I give a lot of importance is that 
your feedback controllers must be well designed. If they are not, you will see a lot of quadrilateral flight where they start shaking, you know, shaking. That's a very, you know, they can't do very aggressive maneuvers or they have to be refined, refined, they, you know, uh, for specific maneuvers. We run these uh, experiments literally on call. You know, you, we can set up different constraints, different things, and the, the quad rollers will behave very well because the feedback controllers are well designed. I can talk more about them, but uh, I would like you to pay attention to that too. Oh, the, the noise will be terrible. Uh, here, uh, again, this aggressiveness of the maneuver comes from two things, well-designed optimal trajectories and well-designed feedback controls to track these trajectories. For some easy flights. Do you use state estimation to the motion capture? Sorry, maybe I missed that. Yeah, yeah, we have come out here to run because we also fly these things outdoors uh, and uh, you know, we don't have motion capture, the sensing is crappy. That's why we have to really pay attention to that. That's also a good point. So uh, also you saw a screen for a while where uh, you were seeing lines squiggling. Uh, what was happening is we were changing the final state and then you, was, you were seeing in real time how the optimal trajectories changed just to show that we weren't cheating. Uh, here, oh, this is an interesting test. Here, what you will see is three quad orders will act like obstacles. First, they will tell, but of course, we are not going to detect obstacles, all this vision and all this stuff. We are not experts. We don't do it. We use, uh, you know, Wicon. In this, uh, not Wicon, OptiTrack, which is, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, which is our motion capture system. Uh, we will let them go in, a, in one direction and the quad order, which will try to avoid them, thinks that it, they will do something. And in midway, we will tell the quad order that we are doing something else now. It's a collaborative maneuver in that way. But you will see the quad order is computing this traje its tra trajectory every second. And as it gets this new information, it will change its plan and it will readjust and fly through them. That's the demo. All right, this was presented in one of these robotics conferences, IROS. <laughs> So is the is this nice behavior that we see from the main quadcopter reacting to the motion of the other quadcopters simply because of the speed at which you can recompute the trajectory or because you're doing prediction? Uh, we are uh, with the speed and also the prediction. I, I assume that I know what they are going to do. They are collaborative. We are cheating. We are not doing some learning or something to figure out. Uh, that gives you, of course, an advantage. You can do uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, of course, if you, there was more uncertainty, then uh, you couldn't do these things because, you know, because of the uncertainty in the motion of other quadrors. But of course, if you don't have good algorithms, no matter how much you know, you will still do a crappy job, you know. Now, uh, also we have an interface, as I said, a human interface tablet. You can literally draw constraints on them and it will implement uh, on the quad rotor uh, uh, as you are doing them. Okay. I'll not talk much about this. I'll just show you uh, a video and then you know you, I can answer more questions. Here, uh, this is the tablet uh, you see. And then uh, I think my student will change some things there. It will move me. Uh, the, the, Constraints will be moved, uh, as, uh, or the final conditions will be moved, and then the like I think I, I think she's changing the constraint a little bit, yeah. 
We have templates for different types of constraints. Uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, you can define different things. So then the trajectory changes accordingly. And the nice thing is uh, you don't have to write the math. If you want to write the math, it, you know, you can't do that in real time. Uh, you know, uh, it, it does it for you. We have a parser uh, that does it for you. Actually, writing that parser is turned out to be a research problem too. Because how do you change the constraints if somebody changes it in a weird way? Can you inform that uh, to the user properly and so on? Not by based upon machine learning or anything, based upon the optimization problem, underlying optimization problem. You say that, look, changing this constraint is causing uh, too much change in uh, your optimality or something. So it's not a human autonomy interface in the usual sense of the word. It's more on the math, based on the math that uh, underlines the problem. So what did you find through that process? What did you find of how was the right way to inform the user that the constraint was no longer <laughs> amenable for the formulation. Uh, visual cues help a lot. Like if we first say, okay, this becomes infeasible or we have bars that shows fuel use and stuff like going up and down. But then we realize these are kind of more obvious things. There are there other things that will tell me like move the constraint to the left and you, everything will open up if you can. That we, there are some ideas we have, but we do mature it to a level that I can talk about them. You know. But that's a very good question. And let's see, oh, these are the people. Uh, and I must give everybody credit for the lab work. I must give credit to Mickey. Now he's in Amazon Prime Air. And Sky, who, is, who took over Mickey, and all the students who worked with me over years. Uh, and this is the group a few years ago, uh, younger. Uh, and then these are the people. These are our sponsors. And uh, thank you. We have a website and a YouTube channel. That only my kids think that my YouTube channel is lame because I only have 100 or 200 signups or something. I, anyways, hopefully some more will sign up. Thank you. <laughs>